be here with you this evening. My name is Pastor David Horton. I serve as one of the two pastors at Eastside in Madison. And uh, welcome to uh, church, to God's house for this, the final of our midweek uh, Lenten services, baptized into his death. Uh, We'll begin with the opening hymn as it's listed for us. It's hymn number 400, Sweet the Moments, Rich in Blessing. And may God bless our worship together this evening. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In Christ, God gives us water welling up for eternal life. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Lord, give us this water, and we shall thirst no more. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. We pray. Blessed are you, sovereign God of all. To you be glory and praise forever. You are our light and our salvation. From the deep waters of death, you have raised your Son to life and triumph. Grant that all who have been born anew by water and the Spirit may daily be renewed in your image. Walk by the light of faith and serve you in newness of life through your anointed Son, Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit we lift our voices of praise. Blessed be you, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Amen. Those who are baptized are called to worship and serve God. Therefore, I ask you, will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers. With the help of God, I will. Will you persevere in resisting evil, and whenever you fall into sin, repent and turn to the Lord? With the help of God, I will. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? With the help of God, I will. Will you seek and serve Christ in all people, loving your neighbor as yourself? With the help of God, I will. Will you acknowledge Christ's authority over human society by prayer for the world and its leaders, 
by defending the weak, and by seeking peace and justice. With the help of God, I will. Then let us pray. Eternal God, our beginning and our end, preserve in your people the new life of baptism as Christ receives us on earth. So may he guide us through the trials of this world and enfold us in the joy of heaven, where you live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seen. We hear our reading for this evening from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. It'll be the basis for this morning's, this evening's sermon. Because Christ also suffered once for sins in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in flesh, but was made alive in spirit, in which he also went and made an announcement to the spirits in prison. These spirits disobeyed long ago when God's patience was waiting in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In this ark, a few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. In corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the guarantee of a good conscience before God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He went to heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Hear the passion reading from the Gospel of Mark, death and burial. The soldiers led him away from inside the palace, which is the praetorium, and called together the whole cohort of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, twisted together a crown of thorns, and put it on him. The soldiers began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. They kept hitting him on the head with a reed and spitting on him. They also kneeled down to pay homage to him. When they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothing on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. A certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country. They forced him to carry Jesus' cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. They crucified him. And they divided his garments, casting lots for them to decide which of that each of them would take. 
to decide what each of them would take. Now it was the third hour when they crucified him. The superscription starting the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They also crucified two criminals with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by ridiculed him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the experts in the law, mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said. He cannot save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also insulted him. When it was the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Heloi, Heloi, Lema Sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. They said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who stood facing him saw how he cried out and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and served him. Many other women also came up with him to Jerusalem. It was already evening, and since it was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph from Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, boldly went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised that he was already dead. He summoned the centurion and asked him if Jesus had been dead for a long time. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he granted the body to Joseph. Joseph bought a linen cloth, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen cloth. He laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of rock, and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were watching where the body was laid. We speak together. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We continue with the hymn of the day. It's hymn number 394, Come to Calvary's Holy Mountain.
We hear again two of the verses, a verse and a half of 1 Peter chapter 3. In this ark, a few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the guarantee of a good conscience before God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters, grace and peace are yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is hard to comprehend the worldwide flood in Noah's day. Back when the foundations of the great deep and the floodgates of the sky were opened, the face of the planet was changed by cataclysmic force as water, we're told, overwhelmed the earth. Nowadays, we're transported seemingly instantaneously to those places of tragedy and disaster we can see in real time, hurricane storm surges that rise, tsunamis that flood. Such waters wipe out entire coastal cities in just a matter of moments. What once was is suddenly gone in a moment. Noah's account in the Bible, that's hard for us to comprehend. It's hard for us to picture those swirling and cascading floodwaters rising up over even the highest of mountains. It's also hard to comprehend just how bad things had become in the world at that time. We hear in the book of Genesis that every inclination of the human heart was only evil all the time. Blatant unbelief ruled over the earth. Believers were almost non-existent. And God's church in Noah's day, and his gospel promise of a savior to come, that was in danger of being wiped out in waves of unbelief. There was a desperate need for God to step in, for God to act, and for God to save. This is the situation that the inspired author Peter refers to in our baptismal focus for this evening. After all, we have a hard time comprehending our naturally sinful state. God tells us in his law that all have sinned and that we were sinful from birth, even from our conception, that our righteous acts were like filthy rags and We have a way of cringing at that news. We don't like to hear, at least part of us doesn't like to hear, that without Jesus we would die and be separated from God forever. Part of us questions, is it really that bad? Is our situation really that dire? Really that serious? I I feel, after all, like I'm a good person. And our old Adam doesn't help matters. It downplays the seriousness of our sin. Even as believers, we might be tempted to approach the great blessings of baptism and we'll kind of sort of want to, at least somewhat, take credit for God's great act. There is a temptation to turn baptism into a symbolic sign of our piety as if baptism is a way to prove to God and others, and maybe even to ourselves a little bit, that we are in some small way able to participate in our own salvation by acting on our own behalf. It's almost like approaching that baptismal font and saying to God, God, do you see me and what I am able to do? Look at me deciding, dedicating, or committing myself to you. But to approach baptism as an outward sign is to turn baptism into a work-righteous act. It would be just as foolish to think that you had your own leg to stand upon as the waters of the flood itself barreled down towards you. What then could we possibly do aside from be swept away in righteous judgment and nothing more? 
God must step in. God must act. God must save. Peter's words for us this evening challenge us to comprehend the absolute compassion in our God's actions. Jesus, the only righteous one, acted to save us many unrighteous. And being baptized into Christ's name means that you have been connected to all that Jesus has done for you. You are connected to Jesus' passion. Peter references that. Christ also suffered once for sins. He was put to death. Why? To bring you to God. Through your baptism, you have a living connection to Jesus right now who is in heaven. The only one able to defeat death and topple the powers of hell. God gives us, therefore, baptism as a sacrament. It is not a sign by which we must prove ourselves outwardly. God is active in baptism. Man is passive. Baptism doesn't represent forgiveness. Baptism gives forgiveness. Peter phrased it as a good conscience before God through Christ. Through God's sacred act of baptism, the Holy Spirit gives you a living faith, forgives your sins, and makes you into his own new creation. In baptism, we find the compassionate heart of our God. Peter uses the flood account to help foreshadow just how full and complete our salvation is in Christ. Water wiped out wickedness and saved God's people from the decay and destruction of sin. Water delivered them from the old reality into a new beginning. Through your baptism, God scoops you up, so to speak, in the ark of his loving arms to save you from death and hell. Adults who desire to be baptized, parents who desire their little ones to be baptized, want what God gives to us in baptism. Through your baptism, God has washed your soul clean and made you into his own dear child. For this reason, you sometimes hear the comparisons of the church to that of the ark itself. After all, here is safety for God's children. Here is where the means of grace, the gospel and word and sacrament abound. Here is where we find Jesus. And here is where God works faith in your hearts and pilots you safely home to heaven. And yet when we come across the element of water which God has so abundantly made available to us on this blue planet, water may serve as a good reminder of what God has accomplished for us in our baptisms. Every time we wash our hands from grime and dirt, we can remember how our souls have been cleansed by God. Every time we look out to the vastness of the ocean, we can remember our past sins now cast by God along with their guilt and shame into the heart of the bottomless sea. Every time we take that bath in warm, relaxing water, we can remember the encompassing warmth of God's love and step out to face each new day as his cleansed and forgiven child refreshed and ready to start a new day of grace with him. Comprehend, if you will, the compassion that God has for you in your baptismal waters. It is where God acts. Baptism now saves you, writes Peter. May it be a daily reminder of his love. Baptism saves you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with our hymn. It's hymn number 647, stanzas 1, 2, and stanza 4. Word and water filled with promise.
Please stand. Our offerings for tonight will be collected in a basket, if you so wish, um, as you exit this evening. We'll continue with the prayers on page 8 of your bulletin. O oh God, our Father, by your mercy and might, the world turns safely into darkness and returns again to light. We place into your hands our unfinished tasks, our unsolved problems, and our unfulfilled hopes, knowing that only what you bless will prosper. To your great love and protection, we commit each other and all those we love, knowing that you alone are our great defender. Amen. Hear us as we pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May God lead you in truth and steady your spirit. May Christ renew your joy and strengthen your will. May the Spirit teach you God's hidden wisdom and fill you with songs of rejoicing. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. It will be hymn number 787, the first two stanzas of God who made the earth and heaven.